All right. Well, I'm going to do a, a real quick overview. Um, I know many of you have had long days, um, legislators, and we greatly appreciate you being here, um, as well as our board and our cabinet and our, and our community members. Uh, this is our annual legislative forum, uh, COVID style, uh, virtual, and um, we're excited to ho host this um, opportunity to have some conversation. There was some great conversation already taking place before we started about bills and topics that impact our school district and our community. Um, for tonight's forum, we'll be providing some information of our current reality during COVID, um, providing some input and feedback on proposed legislation and give um, our elected officials an opportunity to share um, some information uh, with us. There will be a question and answer function um, for those of you that are participating um, at the end of the session. So if you would, please um, wait for your questions um, at that time. Uh, it's my pleasure right now to introduce uh, Warren's school board president, Rachel Burke, um, and, and she will lead the next section here. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. If I could have you rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to start by thanking everybody who could join us here tonight. Um, I'm going to begin with our um, state senators that represent Warren Township. And we have Senator Kreider and Senator Bro and Senator Freeman. And all three are able to be here. And we do so greatly appreciate that, that fact. Um, also, we have invited our state representatives. I know that Representative Gore is on the call and I think is getting moved over. He was having the same problems um, Senator, um, Representative Gore was having the same problems that Senator Kreider was having is my understanding. Um, and that Representative um, Johnson's and Shackelford um, both have conflicts. Um, Representative Johnson is hoping to be able to get here later tonight, but he is currently in a committee meeting. And we have all been in those that have run over. So um, also Councillor Lakeisha Jackson is on the call. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, Councillor Hart may be able to attend later and Councillor Ray also has a conflict, but we do appreciate him letting us know that. Um, and then board member wise, um, I am Rachel Burke. I'm the president of the um, school board for MSD of Warren Township. Also on the call, we have Gloria Williams, who is the board vice president. Um, Terry Amos will be on the call later. She is not yet connected. Um, Julie French and Lashana Triplett and Howard Dorsey are all also on the call as well. And hopefully Michelle Wright will also be able to join us later. I think we're having a combination of technical problems and weather going on. Um, so with that, I want to open by thanking everyone for being here this evening. Um, I have been joking for about a month that this will be the most entertaining and interesting legislative breakfast that we have ever held. Um, because interesting times lead to interesting so, um, situ solutions and that's where we are now. We are 11 months into the largest societal event that most of us have lived through. Virtually every aspect of society has changed and nowhere are those changes more significant than in our public schools. We have reacted as educators, employers, and food and healthcare providers. Our actions and responses cover all age ranges and segments of society. We have kept children and families safe and fed while simultaneously providing employment and education. Society really has had a reawakening in regards to the importance and the necessity of public schools in the work that we do. Um, we are considered a fundamental part of the economic engine, which I think is something that had kind of been forgotten. That is unfortunately and fortunately exactly why every action decision, whether it occurs nationally, internationally, or locally regarding public education is so highly publicized and scrutinized. We are providing a necessary service while operating under a microscope. It is the legislature, um, and some of you were on it and many of you were not, that made the decision years ago, a few years ago, that the general fund would be the primary source of school funding. 
Since the beginning of that shift, the general fund is now a full percentage less of the state's GDP. Um, it began at over 6% and is now roughly 5%. And the amount that urban school districts and specifically Warren Township receives of that has been outplaced by, outpaced by inflation. Once you add on vouchers and unfunded mandate, mandates, um, Senate Bill 54 would be an example, we are doing more and more with less money every year. Our success is important to our community, the state and society as a whole. In order for us to be successful, please hear me when I say that the attacks on public education just have to stop. A year ago, we were promised that teacher pay would be the main consideration of the 2021 to 2023 biennium budget. We were told that the issue of complexity would be addressed. We were assured that the place that public education and public school teachers have in society would be acknowledged and respected. And while I respect that obviously many, many things have changed since that conversation, I know that the message that is heard that when safe and virtual school funding is questioned and threatened, while simultaneously teachers are not allowed to be vaccinated as first responders, a decision many other, in fact, the majority of other states have not made, that it is education and educators seem to be not a primary concern of the state. In order to help hopefully flip that today, we would like to share with you as we do every year, the work that Warren Township is doing and ask for your support. Thank you. Wow. That was quite an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Make sure I'm not muted here. Okay. Um, first, I want to uh, share a, a real success story, and, and there's more than just one story. Last year, Warren Township, along with uh, Richmond School Corporation and MSD Washington Township, spearheaded Senate Bill 398. Um, I know Senator Freeman, you were a part of that um, uh, legislation, so we, we appreciate your support. Um, for us to work with seniors who would not graduate due to extreme credit deficiency, the program focuses on education and skill training. Students build educational skills to pass, pass a national skill assessment and they also earn an Indiana issued high school equivalency or HSE diploma. Students then go on to earn or learn occupational skills to earn an industry recognized career credential. In Warren Township, 14 seniors have joined this program this year. We are proud to share that 10 of those students have successfully earned their HSE equivalency diploma and have begun working towards earning an industry recognized career certification, such as a CDL, nursing assistant, or heating and ventilation HVAC. At this time, I would like to share a testimony by one of those 10 students, Gary Hollenquest, um, with his journey that got him to where he is today. I, I grew up. I say I didn't really have much. I was always struggling through a lot of stuff. Grew up a lot poor, homeless, a lot of, didn't have a lot of places to go. Sorry. Like how I grew up, I say I didn't really have much. I was always struggling through a lot of stuff. Grew up a lot poor, homeless, a lot of, didn't have a lot of places to go. And then I ended up moving in with my grandmother, so. But then, so when I moved in with my grandmother, my mom had passed, my mom had passed away. So that's what really struck me the hardest. And I just stopped, like I completely shut down for a while and I just didn't go to school, didn't leave my house, didn't leave my room, nothing really. I was just stuck in this like little, like, what do I want to call it? Like a dark place. And then that's when my grandmother had enrolled me into Warren, Warren Townships, I'd say. And I think this program is is finally is finally like open and a good light path for me because it's really making some changes for me. I'm telling you that. Cause like I don't if I was still in school, it, it just I didn't see myself really going anywhere other than down in down a dark road and into either jail or dead at that point. So this this program has done a lot for me. Gary is a smart, um, charismatic young man, as you can tell. 
and he was a model student for us. Uh, he's, he's earned his HSE. He is currently working on um, a welding um, certificate and um, it just has been one of, the, one of the many successes. So again, we wanna thank you for your support and allowing us to do this um, so that we can reach some of those students that, that um, still need to be reached. As uh, Rachel shared with you, we are in the middle of a pandemic. And, and what we wanna share with you this evening is the impact that COVID has had on us um, since March 13th, when we closed schools down. And you're gonna hear more details on kind of what you see on the screen here. Um, in all of the situations, whether it was student, family, or staff, our immediate default was basic needs, making sure that food, shelter, physical safety, psychological safety were being met. You will notice that social emotional needs are on all three um, groups because this impact has, um, this impact has been felt on all three of these groups in, in terms of change, uh, dealing with trauma, dealing with individuals that they, they, they know have had COVID or passed from COVID, um, just turning their, root, their routine upside down. Um, obviously, from a student standpoint, you're going to hear about the academic needs. Um, we have made a commitment not to call it learning loss, um, because that implies that our students did something wrong or that our teachers did something wrong. What we're experiencing is an opportunity to learn loss. And what we are going to be focusing on going forward is how do we make up that time? Um, our students have and teachers have lost time to learn. We recognize in Warren Township, as well as many other school districts, that the access to learning through technology was a barrier. And, and you'll hear that tonight and how we've addressed that. I know that Warren is not the only school that has experienced an engagement issue. Um, students um, are not engaging at the same level as they once did. And I can speak personally from having a teenager who's a freshman um, this is a, a lot harder than, than traditional school. Um, the communication you'll see across the board is something that we've really ramped up and, and tried to um, improve and increase as things have been changing on a rapid basis. We needed to make sure that that uh, communication stood, um, was there. Obviously screen fatigue is something that we're dealing with. Um, something specific to Warren and you, Rachel Burke mentioned the complexity issues, and we've had these conversations before um, during the legislative forum. We, we've kind of described that COVID did create, you know, some new problems, but really what COVID has done is it's magnified problems that already existed. We've already had a disproportionate impact um, of, due to poverty and uh, transiency. Um, COVID has um, exaggerated, exaggerated those, those concerns. Um, so it's really forced us, and, and again, you'll hear that later this evening. Um, our staff has done an amazing job. And if there's any time that teachers need to be elevated and, and supported, now is the time because they have worked miracles. Uh, on one end, we've heard that they're essential workers um, and, and they need to, to, to um, align with the same rules and expectations as frontline uh, workers. But on the back end of this, they're not, um, treated as essential workers in terms of vaccination. And whether that's intentional or not intentional, the message that's getting to our, our teachers right now is not a positive one, nor is it a supportive one. And um, our teachers are going through a lot. They have care fatigue. Uh, they're trying to figure out their own situation based on, on what COVID has caused and maintain um, a high quality experience for their students. So the next few slides and the next few presenters are going to share with you kind of what our current reality is um, in each of their spaces. Uh, the first one that I will introduce is Brian Simpkins, our Chief Human Resource Officer. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending and joining us this evening. Um, I just wanna say a few words briefly about Warren's response to COVID from an HR standpoint. Uh, certainly there've been um, uh, a lot of opportunities and challenges, uh, but um, you've heard us say it before, and indeed it's true, we are primarily a people-oriented business, and so uh, investing in our people and our staff is of paramount importance. 
And that's never been more true than uh, the past year. And as I reflect, I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Hansen. It's really amazing how um, our staff have, uh, despite the anxieties and the stress and um, everything we've had to contend with, all things considered, how they've performed admirably in their roles. And so we're so appreciative of that. Uh, just, you know, as you can imagine, and in the best of times, staffing can be a real challenge. Uh, but certainly with COVID, um, uh, balancing student enrollment with appropriate staffing levels to maintain both virtual options and in-person options has been, has been very challenging. And you'll hear more from my colleagues in a minute uh, about some of that. Um, but um, you know, with the virtual, it was kind of like constructing a school from scratch, you know, the proverbial building the airplane while flying it. And, um, and uh, as HR's role was always to make sure that staff uh, we had to kind of look at student enrollment versus uh, numbers of staff and FTEs because we knew we needed virtual teachers, uh, but we didn't necessarily want to hire a whole slew of new teachers to teach virtually uh, in addition to in-person teachers. So you can imagine not only gauging student enrollment, but also gauging staffing levels was extremely challenging. Um, uh, but we pulled it off and... Um, um, my colleagues have done a wonderful job. Every time we've had to pivot, um, uh, even though we had to go back to uh, briefly uh, all virtual operations, we've, we've always been able to manage to get people where they need to be uh, despite the challenges. Of course, with virtual, we've always required our virtual teachers to still report physically to work um, uh, unless there was a, 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 um, a justified accommodation. Uh, they all still physically report to work. Uh, and then for in-person, we would always look at staffing uh, primarily in the sense that we wanted to make sure that we fostered social distancing and that we were making sure that the school experience in person was always safe for both staff and students. Um, you probably have, have heard plenty and don't need me to tell you that it's been a challenge uh, often to uh, cover teacher absences. Uh, in fact, in most cases, um, you hear from districts where if they've had to close down or switch gears, it's often because sub coverage was wanting and is very difficult to, uh, um, to cover, cover classrooms, not so much with positive cases. In fact, um, school over, overwhelmingly, the school environment has been very safe, uh, but um, we've had challenges with quarantines and isolations. Uh, and so there were times where um, uh, things would get a little grim and uh, we always keep track of the COVID data and, um, and so uh, we've had to come up with creative solutions like paying some of our instructional assistants a bonus, uh, hourly bonus for stepping in sometimes to sub. Um, even for virtual teachers, um, we've had to come up with creative ways to make sure that um, lessons get covered and those types of things. So as you can imagine, sub coverage has been a challenge. And Warren, this is our first year with um, going with Kelly Education Services for our subs, and even they have contended with COVID. Um, and so... Um, that has been an overwhelming challenge, as I'm sure you've heard. Uh, we've had to be ever vigilant with health and safety protocols for staff, and you'll hear more about that from uh, Mr. Holt. Um, but we had to kind of condition our staff to get used to the idea of taking some extra steps. Everybody really had to pitch in above and beyond the usual, um, including classroom teachers, in terms of making sure that um, certain cleaning protocols were kept, kept up um, and uh, that we were extra diligent in doing that. Um, of course, providing PPE and those types of things for staff. Uh, screening procedures were essential. As we got into the school year, we had to make sure that before any staff member reports physically to work, that they make sure that they screen themselves and monitor their own health. And that um, certainly if you uh, were exhibiting symptoms, you know, uh, report that to your supervisor, don't come to work, uh, or check to make sure whether and to what extent you may have been in close contact with somebody and those types of things. So screening before coming to work has been something that we've all had to get used to and conditioned to. Um, and of course, tracking, as I mentioned, tracking COVID data. We've had to, along with that, keep up to date on guidance uh, and stipulations from the CDC, the State Department of Health, uh, and the County Department of Health. And so just constantly maintaining um, uh, both for students and staff positive cases cases where people have been quarantined, um, reporting those and, um, and just keeping tabs on that. Um, of course, in HR in my shop, um, we work closely individually with each employee as they, as they contend with um, 
um, quarantines and isolations. And then as the employer, we direct them on, hey, uh, we gather the facts, we gather the documentation, and we just make sure that they understand um, the timelines involved and so on. Um, uh, you've, you've heard, I'm sure, of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. The first semester of the school year, that was in force. And so that could involve anything from providing job protected leave for situations involving one's child, uh, child's child care shutting down for COVID, uh, perhaps, um, um, perhaps their child's school went all virtual. Uh, we, we dealt a lot with that early on. But in addition, um, whether you had to maybe take care of a parent or a loved one and those types of things under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So we would handle a lot of that job protected leave and keep tabs on that. As you know, that lapsed on December 31st, but Warren Township made the conscious decision to continue on with job protected leave as necessary in certain circumstances. Um, and that's just one example where we've um, frankly gone to bat for, for working people in our district. Um, we also continue to address uh, specific staff accommodations and work from home flexibility on a case by case basis. Um, as you, and so for instance, we've had you know, a number of teachers um, over the age of 60 who depending on their health condition may have not have felt safe. And so uh, um, I can remember going back to July and actually um, meeting with four or five teachers a day who had legitimate health concerns or um, due to age were concerned about and so uh, one way or another, we were able to accommodate folks um, and um, a, lot of them, a lot of folks who had some health issues but felt comfortable teaching virtually, for instance, in an empty classroom, uh, ended up being a viable option. So we continue to work with, uh, with staff one-on-one -on -one with accommodations and, and um, if applicable, certain, certain ability to work from home. Um, finally, uh, in regard to support staff, especially with regard to operations, um, uh, oftentimes, as you can imagine, the COVID pandemic has impacted uh, the, those staff with work disruptions. Um, and um, we have done a lot of novel and creative things to invest in our people to keep things going. So for instance, um, uh, what I mentioned the health protocols. So for, for our custodians, especially the day custodians at the schools, uh, they had all of a sudden way more work than usual. So uh, we accordingly then increased their pay we also uh, pull bus drivers and we pay them a certain rate um, in between their AM and PM routes. Uh, in, a, in, a, in our K-4 buildings, for instance, we had two bus drivers on hand to help with uh, the front office work as well as help, our, help the day custodian with uh, some basic cleaning. Um, and those are just a couple of small examples of, uh, of how we have tapped people and um, kind of gone all in on making sure things continue to operate. And of course, when we went all virtual from about mid-November to mid-January, we, we tapped a lot of our uh, uh, transportation staff to do all kinds of jobs from helping with childcare opportunities and uh, more cleaning and, and all kinds of other operation, uh, operations and projects that we had going on. So those are a couple of just brief ways that we have contended with the challenges and opportunities with COVID from, from an employee and staff perspective. Dr. Hansen? Thank you, Brian. Um, we'll just kind of move through this and then if you have questions at the end, legislators, um, feel free to, to, to ask those. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Uh, legislators, you know, every year I like, I always want to thank you for your time. Um, you know, this is my 21st legislative forum, and um, it's always one of my favorite things of the year. I, th I think the opportunity to share our um, successes, share our stories is important for you to hear, but also um, us to maybe uh, give you some ideas that uh, maybe we are seeing legislatively that um, we can provide you some insight. But, you know, in, in the response to COVID, as I look at it from an operations perspective, you know, we really broke it down to facilities, transportation, and food service. And how could those three areas uh, support um, the different learning um, environments that we were going through, whether it be in person, hybrid, virtual, um, from a facilities perspective, you know, we really had to step back and rethink how we were going to ensure, first and foremost, that our facilities were safe for um, our students and our staff. And we had always done a very good job in our facilities area, but we really had to 
to take a step back and, and really identify those high traffic areas, high touch areas, and how are we going to, from a capacity standpoint, make sure those were clean every day. So we, we had to reevaluate our staffing. We had to reevaluate um, different roles and responsibilities to ensure that restrooms, office areas, lobby areas, nurses, playgrounds, cafeterias were cleaned not just once during the day, but multiple times throughout the day. Uh, you know, making sure that every classroom had appropriate uh, disinfectant, hand sanitizer, microfiber towels to help. Uh, as Brian talked about, we, we, we are very fortunate that our professional staff have jumped in and, and been part of the solution to help us make sure that whenever we have students in our buildings that we are providing a safe environment and, and our teachers have done a tremendous job to to help in that process where we can't necessarily get to those areas um, from a custodial perspective and then also just in the business office really one of our biggest challenges was identifying how to get ppe back in the summer it was very difficult and we were calling we were getting online just to order disposable masks hand sanitizer um, everything that was necessary plexiglass um, standards to, to make sure people were safe and we are still finding challenges of three to six month delays on on sometimes ordering things but we've done a nice job of getting out in front of that we started march 13th actually ordering supplies and we were one of the first to actually get some things so when we were ready to start second uh to start back in August, we had everything we needed and we've maintained that um, that inventory in our warehouse and as schools need disposable mask, any sort of PPE equipment supplies, we're able to deliver that on a, on a daily and, a, and especially a weekly basis. I wanna give a shout out to our transportation folks as we've um, modified, changed, um, created new opportunities to reach kids. Uh, we've always been able to find the ability to reroute create new, new bit midday opportunities and always find a way to get kids to and from school, but also safely. Every bus is cleaned and sanitized after each route. And then we've taken extra steps to every two weeks, we have a cleaning crew come in and completely scrub and fog every bus to make sure that um, not only what they're doing daily and after each route, um, but we get to, um, hit every square inch of the bus every two weeks. And that has really made it a, a safe environment. And I believe our transportation is not ever going to be a barrier for safety when it comes to COVID. And then lastly, uh, it's always been an emphasis in this district to make sure our students have adequate accessibility to food. And I'm, I'm extremely proud of our food service area for never skipping a beat from March 13th to today, we have not taken a week off in distributing food to um, all of our students in need and all of our virtual families. Um, we made modifications for those buildings that have been in person. We had to make modifications to how we were serving, um, how we were seating kids in the cafeterias. Um, we've done that all um, extremely well, very safe, but I'm proud to say that those kids and those students that weren't able to be in person. Um, since March, we've served over 425,000 meals that uh, families and students have been able to come um, pick up at multiple locations. We tried multiple times. We do everything we can to make sure that that, that food is accessible. And I feel really good that we've uh, been meeting that need. Thank you, David. Allison Woods. Good evening. So I'm going to talk with you guys about a number of different things, starting with um, social emotional uh, and looking at this really through a student lens. You know, when we closed our doors on March 13th of last year, um, everybody walked out not realizing that they weren't coming back. And so when we started the school year, we really had to look at some closure activities. Uh, you know, the end of the year celebrations, the goodbye to teachers, the goodbye to classmates. Um, students weren't able to get that and we had to acknowledge that um, that is necessary um, so we could have a fresh start this year. Um, 
you know, we're really proud that K-12, we have a social emotional curriculum, um, uh, not K-12, K-8 for um, all students, which is, which is our second step curriculum. Uh, we did run into challenges with our virtual learning. Second step is meant for in-person instruction. So some of the videos and the extension activities um, essentially didn't work for the virtual environment. So the, that was something that we had to adapt and adjust to make sure that um, we were also providing our students that were in our virtual learning academy um, access to that daily social emotional um, you know curriculum and support you know another thing that we've seen with um, this pandemic and with students being not in the building on a regular basis whether that be because we are closed because they're virtual because of hybrid model um, is that they don't have access to the counselors and our gallaghy mental health therapists in the same way they would if they were in person you know, our counselors who can stop by and check in on students, who can pull small groups. Um, that is that we still have outreach. We're still trying to be proactive with our students that are not in person, but that's hard when they're not seeing the classroom down the hall that you can just go grab them out of and check on them. Uh, you know, another thing that we've seen because of the um, pandemic really statewide is the need for mental health support for both students and staff and their families um, really has risen. And um, the availability to get that in a timely manner is, um, is not always available. We have you know, folks that really need that and then have to wait weeks to be able to get appointments places um, just because the need for that um, is so great. Um, you know, one thing, a really shining star that came out of this, um, in the spring, we started a community outreach hotline. Once we closed and we know that we needed a place for people to call if they had questions and support, we created a phone number that we put out there, um, not knowing what we were doing, um, essentially. And um, we had sometimes 10 people working that line um, from open to close, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., that's all they did all day was um, receive phone calls and return phone calls for people who needed support. And some of that was, how do I get on Zoom? How do I access the lessons? But we also had a lot of, I need food or we're quarantined and I can't get to the grocery store and I need clothes or we are don't have housing. Um, and so from that, you know, we had a plan as a district to open a community resource center, but um, the pandemic really jump started the need for that. Uh, and so James Taylor and his team um, launched and opened the uh, Moorhead Community Resource Center um, in um, the fall of this school year. And if you haven't been over there, I really encourage you to reach out to Mr. Taylor and set up a visit. I know Senator Kreider, you've been over there, um, but they have done some incredible community outreach with um, food drives and holiday drives and um, coats. I think they gave out 200 coats um, one day last week. Um, just accessing um, the, uh, assessing the needs of our community and working to um, reach them. And so um, please, if you haven't had a chance to go over there, um, they're just getting started and we're really excited to see where that, where that goes. Uh, you know, for our exceptional learners, we've had a lot of challenges, um, figuring out how to do special education um, in virtual. How do we evaluate students when we can't bring them in? Um, or they're not able to come in. Um, what do services look like and how do we document that, make sure that we're meeting all of those individual education plans. Uh, we have really fantastic teachers that have worked hard and worked um, in learning lots of new tricks and technology and breakout rooms and Zoom to meet student needs. Um, we've also been really fortunate that our special programs so our students with our more significant disabilities have been coming in the building, um, even during times when we've been closed. So when we were closed for the November through um, the mid-January for our K-4, we were still bringing our um, students with more significant disabilities in a couple days a week in small groups, just because they can't fully access their education just virtually. Um, you know, figuring out how to do related services. What is occupational therapy when you're teaching kids how to write and how to dress 
look like when they're at home. Uh, you know, the equipment and the supplies and materials that um, students need to be able to do those activities at home. We've had to put work boxes and activity boxes together so students could um, participate in their therapies or come in and get those therapies. Um, for our English language learners, we had a big learning curve with this. You know, um, uh, you know, you may or may not know, we have a lot of students right now that are not in this country that are uh, uh, participating in our virtual learning academy. So figuring out, okay, how do we have Zoom that will allow kids from out of the country to join because they went to visit family um, and weren't able to get back or because um, that's just the safest place for them right now. Uh, you know, one of the things about our English language learners is having peer models, having teachers and um, curriculum that's accessible to them um, at school and when they're at home, um, they don't have those peer models to the same extent and they have um, parents supporting their learning to a great degree that often um, are learning the language themselves. Um, and so, you know, really trying to find unique ways to make sure our English language learners are connected with our um, English language learners, teachers, and our support staff. Um, we also are sending a lot of communication to families, not just through the schools, but through the state and through the health department. Um, and not a lot of that is, you know, we work really hard to translate our materials, but there's a lot of things that are not translated into other languages um, for everyone in the community to be able to access and to understand. For our high ability students, uh, you know, our assessments um, from last spring, we didn't have the ability to completely do those. So looking at identification for this year was challenging. And also for next year, looking at, you know, having our virtual learners come in um, to assess for um, identification and then also being able to access all the high ability content. What is available in a virtual world as opposed to an in-person world when we're trying to do both um, has its challenges. So we've had to think outside the box. You know, we have some eighth graders that are um, in some high school Spanish classes um, online and trying to give opportunities and make opportunities for students so they're not falling behind um, and can continue to excel in their academics. And then I want to um, shout out to um, Ms. Fessler and our preschool staff. We um, have worked really hard, Ms. Fessler and her staff have worked really hard to keep our preschool open um, for our um, age three to five year old kiddos that are there. Um, and that has been open since the beginning of the school year and it has been open five days a week um, for childcare and preschool. But um, they are really scrambling to, um, to make it there as well. There are students to staff ratios that they have to meet for licensing and when you have um, COVID and um, people that are quarantined and you still have to meet those ratios, that's important. There's cleaning complexities. So as Mr. Holt talked about at the at all the schools, when you go into a preschool classroom that has blocks and um, you know toys and trucks, um, how to make sure that we're appropriately cleaning those every night. We've had to get unique, um, have some unique situations there with um, uh, lights and fog machines and really thinking outside the box. And then also enrollment. Um, preschool enrollment has um, has suffered because parents are choosing to keep their young kids who are not school age home during this time, um, which, you know, that that creates an um, issue with with enrollment and making sure that we can, um, you know, keep our folks employed over there and that we're, they're bringing in income to be able to um, to keep that building going. So they're working really hard. We still have openings over there. So if you know kids who need preschool and parents that need that, um, reach out to Mrs. Fessler and her crew. Thank you, Allison. Um, at this time, Pam Griffin is going to speak about our virtual program that we put in place. Due to the need um, for virtual, we designated one of our assistant superintendent um, main roles to oversee the virtual um, program. So Pam. Thank you. And thank you again for this opportunity. Um, predicting the needs of our school community during a pandemic is a skill that we have continued to cultivate and model for our community during this time. Um, the balancing act of trying to ensure that our students have learning opportunities as well as trying to maintain continuity with course offerings and experiences is um, a deeply, deeply personal um, mission for our district as well as our teachers. When we started this journey with our virtual learning, um, at the end of semester one, we had 4,282 students in that program. 
Um, when we started in the very, very beginning, we predicted that number would be somewhere from 700 to 1,000. And here we are in semester two, um, we still have 3,238 students who are being served in that program. Um, when a district the size of ours is working um, to make sure that we are trying to find a balance to meet the needs of our families, whether it be in person or whether it be in the learning environment, um, it is, like I said, a mission that we take very seriously. And so I've tried to frame this out in four areas for you. Um, first of all, as a, dif as a district, safeguarding all students, making sure that they have access to their education. And that's not just their content, that's access to their teachers, their service providers, um, the people that um, in their normal school experiences when they are attending every day, help them be successful. Um, that is something that is very important to us. Kids need to interact with their teachers and teachers need to interact with their students. But also within the learning environment, as Allison has already shared, the social emotional supports um, are just as important in finding that time to create those opportunities for students in the virtual um, environment is something that is a must have. But also, um, when you don't have students coming to school, we need to make sure that our communication is on spot and consistent so that all of our families know where they can go to access food and services when they need it. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight, and I know that um, our state leadership, some of you have influence um, on the, our education committee, is that we are, have rolled into state and federal accountability assessment season. I step plus, we've already um, started that. We started that last semester. I read, I learn, WIDA. Um, the truth is, is that this is adding disruption to our learning. Our learning is already disrupted and we've worked really hard to make sure that our students have um, as much contact time with their teachers as possible, or as possible. But even in our in-person environment, when our students are seeing their teachers every other day, um, and our students in the virtual learning academy are seeing their teachers virtually, um, that instructional time is golden. And as we think about state assessment within the context of what it takes away from a normal school year, uh, when you have to schedule it in. Um, I wanted to share with you that within the context of where we are today within our in-person and our virtual learning, we already have a disruption to the continuity of the fact that some of our students only see their teacher every other day for direct instruction, for opportunities to interact, to get additional help, to have that connection to school. And now um, we are taking that time away from our teachers and our students and we're filling it with um, state assessment. And something that you may be aware of or you may not be aware of, but in order to meet the timeline um, of completing these assessments because of the size of our schools, the number of the students we serve in our in-person and virtual learning environment, um, not only will we be sacrificing time during the school day that could be spent, on um, opportunities for learning to take assessments, but we will also be giving this test after school in order to meet the expectation for participation and possibly Saturdays. The normal Monday through Friday school day is not going to be enough um, for us to complete this test successfully while also respecting the needs of our families who have selected the learning environment for very deeply personal reasons. And so I did want to take a moment and highlight that. Um, as Dr. Hansen has already said, you know, if I could sing, I would literally sing the praises of our staff, um, our teachers, our custodians, our transportation people, our secretaries, um, our registrars. As Brian said earlier, when we opened up the Virtual Learning Academy option, um, we shifted 45 in-person teachers into the virtual learning world and they teach grades K through six. And then from Alice's side, from Office of Exceptional Learners, um, we added 26 teachers who are experts in exceptional learning, in learning such as special education and um, providing supports to our English language learners. Um, when you think about that, that is larger than some brick and mortar schools that are serving communities right now. And so 
On top of what we have going there, we also have the needs of our in-person students that are coming every other day hybrid so that we can socially distance safely within our schools to protect our students and staff and how we're providing services to those families as well when their students are learning from home. Um, and we're doing all of that while creating relationships with um, our students and maintaining them. And um, you, many of our legislators and representatives and senators know that this is a point of pride in Warren Township. The pride of the East Side is that relationship that we create with our students. And um, you know that is something that uh, some teachers are really, really, really um, working hard to not sacrifice because it is a big portion of why we do the work that we do. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of is the fact that our staff have stepped up in a really big way and they've learned things that they've not had to do before and they have really grown um, as educators so that they can meet the needs of our students. And so we will be providing 45 professional growth points to all of our Warren teachers to recognize their hard work and dedication um, to developing their skills um, within the craft of teaching. Um, some of our teachers have had to sacrifice their graduate programs. They've had to step away from their own education in order to be fully invested um, in our schools during this time. And so we wanna make sure that anything that we can do to honor and highlight that work and to reward them for that is also recognized. Um, our students, you know, they are really, um, like our teachers and our staff, the heroes in this situation as well, they have really had to learn how to approach their learning in a much different way. Um, you know, our little Zoomers are engaging with um, not just their teachers, but they're in, interacting and collaborating with their peers. And um, we're really proud of the progress that they've made there. And then also in regards to the, the um, needs of our secondary students, um, the lift and making sure that we can offer all of the courses that our students deserve to have access to um, in their core content areas, AP, CTE, dual credit, um, performing arts is a significant lift. And um, it's one that we have worked again, like I said, very hard to make sure that no student has to sacrifice um, a course um, that they need for a graduation pathway or to help them earn that additional college credit so that um, they can offset some of the costs of um, their future education. And lastly, our parents and our caregivers, um, not only have um, they've had the normal transition of learning like what it's like to be an elementary parent, to a middle school parent, to a high school parent. Well, now imagine making that transition as a virtual parent or a hybrid parent. And, um, our parents have had to learn how to use, utilize technology in a way that allows them to connect them with their teachers and to, and to support their students in a different way. Um, and as we've shared a little bit, one of the um, things that we've had to work really, really closely with some of our families on um, is just making sure that they have access to email and accurate email um, and also accurate student information. Um, when you're living in a pandemic, and um, what people sometimes fail to realize is that um, our families, as they're transitioning from one place to another to take care of their loved ones, um, the last thing they're thinking about is making sure we have an updated address or email address. And so, um, again, this is just a few of the areas that I wanted to highlight for you. Again, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Dr. Hansen. Thank you, Pam. And kind of transitioning with that, um, we'll be Kent Schroeder, our CTO, to talk a little bit about the challenges we faced with um, technology. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just to give you a little history. Until last April, we were only a one-to-one -one student to device district at our high school where students kept the device with them at school and at home. Um, in grades kindergarten through eight, we had a classroom cart model where devices were often shared. Um, and we had extras, right? We had a couple of extras in each classroom. However, when the pandemic began, uh, we were forced to become a fully one to one district where students use their devices at home. And that has continued on uh, to this year. We've expanded a true one to one in grades five through 12. And obviously our virtual students in uh, elementary schools have their devices at home. 
So obviously that, that means remote learning was new to not only our students, but as Mrs. Griffin was pointing out, the rest of our families as well. Um, part of the issue is uh, many families, they just lack uh, good, stable home internet access. Um, through some grant dollars, we were able to deploy right now over 2,000 LTE mobile hotspots through T-Mobile. Um, that works most of the time. It's not always a good solution. There are gaps in coverage. Uh, often that makes it difficult to get good access. You know, Zoom requires really good download and upload speeds. So that requires a lot more data bandwidth than the traditional homework access that students use. So, and, and a lower cost home internet, uh, it, it can also be. So even if you have a direct connection through Comcast or AT&T, uh, the lower ones, they still rate limit you quite a bit, especially on the upload speeds, which can make uh, Zoom a little more uh, difficult to use. Um, part of our challenge has just been parent support. Uh, it's stretched our already thin IT staff. Uh, today we have 14,000 users, that's students and employees, 22,000 computers, and as I mentioned, 2,000 hotspots that we support with a staff of seven. So uh, we have additional staff that support our student information system and uh, manage data and state reporting, but those seven uh, staff members are responsible for all all of the rest of that. So we've, we've also expanded to, uh, to provide parent support on site at the Community Resource Center. Uh, we also take uh, phone calls from parents at our help desk and we were able to extend our help desk ticketing system to offer parent remote access through our websites. They can get in and open a ticket without having to visit one of our locations. So to give you a uh, an idea, we've done about 730 online requests in the last five months, uh, a thousand or so in-person visits to the resource center since the beginning of school, over 500 calls for a help desk. Um, you know, parents, as Mrs. Griffin was pointing out again, they were new to online learning as well. So they were learning how to use applications like our learning management system, our student information system, and many other learning applications that we have, including Zoom, right, for the first time. So they needed a lot of support with that. And sometimes it was as basic as how do I just log in uh, so that my student can uh, attend class. So those numbers mean roughly we, the Warren Technology Department alone has interacted with about 30% of our family so far this year. So nearly a third of our families have uh, met with either uh, directly or by the phone or online through, uh, through our technology department. So that presents some challenges, especially diagnosing, uh, you know, device issues or damage. Uh, we often end up just swapping out a new device because it's so critical for the students to have access from home. Uh, when we had the CART model, or even at the high school before, they were still coming to school every day. So if they had damage to their Chromebook, we could uh, fix it and have it back to them within 24 hours. So that doesn't quite work in our current setup. So, you know, we, we've, in, in addition to the Community Resource Center help desk for families and the other options I've talked about, we also offer a help desk at our high school for two hours each morning. And we have an option uh, in our middle schools, intermediate middle schools, for students to swap their non-working Chromebooks for a new one in the media center. So there, you know, that means that we're diagnosing that much later. We're just trying to uh, run to keep up with the demand. Um, and, you know, again, those uh, uh, device issues mean that we could have challenges with state testing, right? One is getting students on site for that, but then ensuring that the devices they're going to use to test work properly, and if they don't, then we also need to have loaner devices. And that means, especially our third and fourth grade students, you know, they, they use an iPad all year. It's possible they may have to take their state testing on a Chromebook. That's not the end of the world. It's different than what they're accustomed to. So that's just another curveball. So that's a challenge that we're preparing for right now. We're uh, uh, getting many of our old uh, 
uh, Chromebooks back in operable uh, condition so that we can use those as uh, loaners for testing. Thank you, Kent. And then lastly, um, Ryan Russell, uh, one of our assistant superintendents will kind of give an um, overview of our in-person instruction um, as well as the challenges there. Good evening, everyone. I echo my colleagues' appreciation for your time tonight. I know it's an incredibly busy time of year for you guys and uh, your time's appreciated. Uh, my colleagues have um, really articulated just the unique challenges, obviously, from a variety of different departments within those. And I, I don't want to be repetitive on some of those, uh, I, but I do want to emphasize a few points. Uh, when I say teaching and learning has become a secondary need, I'm not saying that our focus is not on teaching and learning. However, we've had to elevate the, the, the basic hierarchy of needs for our students uh, and community. Uh, as Allison specifically pointed out, social emotional wellness, basic needs, uh, the amount of calls we get uh, specifically for housing, food and health service assistance um, is something that's not traditionally designed for a public school system, but one that we're happy to support our community with and something additional that we take on. I really wanna convey just from a perspective of um, our building leaders, our principals and our teachers, just the operational needs of what uh, COVID has brought to us. Uh, so when we say things like PPE and hybrid schedules and transportation, health services and all these things, each of them took a different layer of intensity uh, when it came to planning what this school year would look like. We've referenced the infamous March 12th 2020 date uh, that seemed to uh, what feels like feels like more than a year ago at this point. Uh, but from that point on, obviously, we certainly didn't know when the go date would be when we came back to school. Uh, but with those things specifically, we've spent a, a significant amount of time coming up with new processes and procedures uh, for, with really for everything operationally that we do. David mentioned the uh, difficulty to find PPE. But from a building perspective, making sure students have PPE, making sure students know why they need PPE, making sure uh, they're wearing PPE, uh, hybrid schedules, obviously for us in Warren that applies specifically to our students in grades six through 12, which day do I go to school? Which day do I not go to school? And just the enorm uh, enormous amount uh, of record keeping that that entails. Transportation was no longer as simple as getting on a bus, right? Getting on a bus with a seating sheet and spacing ourselves apart. Or the event that we did have a case or a close contact that we would have to go back through records to be able to track that. All of these are man hours that take our buildings, right? Uh, specifically to do that. Health services, as you're aware, we've had to create specific isolation rooms in each of our buildings. Uh, those have to be staffed and they have to have appropriate equipment. Cleaning. Um, look, every single person in this di district has taken on some aspect of cleaning, uh, whether you're a teacher cleaning off desk in between classes, whether you're a student who may participate in those classes, whether you're one of the custodial crews that's picking up the cleaning cloths, microfiber tops, cloths that we utilize uh, every night um, is it, just an additional need. Classroom setups. Um, if you've ever been in a classroom, you know, teachers have a lot of stuff, right? And some of that stuff had to be removed in order to um, make room for social distancing with that. Cafeterias, not all of our students are eating in the cafeteria. We don't wanna stuff as many students in a cafeteria for the spacing. So that means we're eating lunch in classrooms in many cases, um, and that requires more supervision. Hallways, uh, we, we have an interstate system now with yellow tape directing students where to go. Um, we also have the first pedestrian roundabout in Indianapolis at Warren Central High School now, um, um, as we affectionately refer to it as. And then COVID tracking, tr tracking, not only the data tracking, the contact tracing and everything else, uh, just an enormous amount of time and effort there. Uh, two main points um, I wanna make uh, just moving forward. Uh, learning hubs, so even when we have been closed um, and move to fully virtual for 100% of our students. I think it's important just to reiterate, we have never fully closed our doors to all students. Allison mentioned specifically the services and uh, that we provided for uh, exceptional learning students, special ed. 
Um, however, uh, we've identified stu students most at risk with social emotional needs, with academic needs, and we've continued to transport them in the buildings to provide support to those students. We felt we could do that. We felt that it was critical. Um, and we continue to do that uh, regardless of, of what that approach looks like. Um, one of the biggest pressure points and quite frankly pain points for us as we move forward has been student attendance and engagement. Uh, COVID has become a priority in every industry, right? It, it's changed every industry with that. Um, and it's certainly caused us um, um, some significant engagement and attendance issues. Uh, so what I try to qualify here is when we specifically refer to opportunity loss and the support that we need uh, when we talk about the opportunities that our students have missed, what does that mean? Significantly for us, it's the um, decrease in credit obtainment of our high school students. As we know, our students require a certain amount of credits to graduate. Um, this has provide a, provided a significant challenge for us. Um, to make sure that even after one semester in this 2021 school year, we've seen increased rates in students not obtain credits, which is gonna have a long lasting impact. Uh, we're prepared and ready to respond to that, uh, but that, that rise is significant. Decrease in attendance as we've talked about. Students, um, students are taking care of needs and that need not always, is not always learning for that day. Uh, we have a significant amount of students working to help provide for their family, which doesn't coincide all, um, with attending school every day at typical times. Uh, increased need for remedial classes. This is K-12. This is Students uh, who have had this opportunity loss are going to need extended time and extended school in some capacity, and we're looking forward to ways where we can accomplish that over the next several years. Uh, limited access to all school resources. So whether you're fully virtual, or you're not coming to school every day, uh, there's some things that can't be accomplished um, over a computer screen. Classrooms are stocked with resources, supply, curricular tools and stuff that don't just significant, don't just get sent home. We try to send as much home as we can, uh, but an in-person school environment has a lot of resources for students uh, that are just housed in the classroom. And you have limited access to adults as well. And obviously uh, the single most important resource in our district is an adult student relationship. Uh, and that's been limited and causes that adult or that causes that opportunity loss as well. And then reduced peer interactions. Um, students need opportunities to interact with their peers in person. Uh, yes, there are some fundamental things we can do virtually with students, uh, but we certainly know and we see as a society the benefit of um, for us, we see everything as a teaching opportunity. We teach peer interaction, right? That, that's a learn skill that without practice suffers. And I think we all um, certainly can uh, qualify uh, the consequences of a lack thereof. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Dr. Hanson, back to you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, cabinet and legislators. If, if it's okay, we're gonna proceed through the, the presentation uh, slide deck. Um, there will be some opportunity at the end for you to share comments or questions if you have anything specific about this. Uh, we know that that took a little bit uh, longer than um, we, we have time for necessarily, but we really wanted to highlight kind of the challenges that we've been facing and the uh, enormous lift and um, success that really we've had with the work of our teachers and our administrators and our families um, through this process. At this time, I'm gonna ask uh, David Holt to share a little bit about some legislative support and uh, concerns. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hansen. As we um, always come to you with just, you know, what we're watching, what we're following, um, you know, House Bill 1001 is always number one on our list. Um, we, we ask you to always um, make sure that you are looking at the K-12 appropriation and appropriately looking at the tuition support and uh, make sure that's being adequately funded on an annual basis in a time when we are um, dedicating lots of time and effort and strategies to um, continue to um, improve the teacher compensation issues in the state of Indiana. It's, it's a, it is a time that all available resources need to be pushed um, to uh, the K-12 funding uh, appropriation and line item. 
uh, you know, we need to continue to make sure we have conversations and good conversations about complexity funding. And then that third bullet point is really something that is something I, I've been talking a lot about here recently in that, you know, with, with COVID and just other issues um, nationally, you know, the, 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 the conversation between the difference between equity and equality, our current um, K-12 funding model is an equality model and it's, it's moving more and more towards that and moving away from equity. And that complexity funding is important for us to make sure that we move back towards more of an equity, to make sure that we are addressing all students. I've, I've told you for years, if you create a level playing field for Warren, we will win, um, but we don't always have a level playing field. So please on, on, on 1001, make sure that is um, being addressed appropriately for K-12 funding. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank all of you for your support on uh, House Bill 1002 and, and, and Senate Bill 1. We talked in the fall to a lot of your staffers, um, specifically about our concerns about uh, civil immunity and, and potential liability that could arise through COVID. And you have addressed that and you've presented bills that are moving forward that help us um, protect uh, potential risk of liability. And I, I, I thank you for that. Any questions you would have about our concerns, I would be happy to address with you. Um, but most importantly, I wanna thank you for 1003 and, and Senate Bill 2 um, that helped um, improve the Indiana code that allowed uh, second semester funding to be 100% funded for those students that are receiving virtual instruction. Mrs. Griffin told you that second semester we have 3,238 students still enrolled 100% virtually. Uh, at 85%, that would have been a loss of $427.73 per student this semester. Um, so that would have resulted in a loss of one point, almost $1.4 million to uh, MSD Warren. And I know that bills, uh, those bills have moved um, and been passed, and I appreciate your support on that. You know, our concerns were were heard um, in both chambers and, and all caucuses, and, and I, I really appreciate your support on that. Dr. Hansen, the next, uh, some, some challenges, some concerns um, that we want to bring to your attention, 1005, 412, and, and 413 expand school choice. Those are concerning at a time when we need to be addressing all available resources and appropriations to uh, public schools. These bills increase the income eligibility for school choice vouchers. Uh, they create a new funding program for students not enrolled in public schools to receive state tuition support um, to pay for their education dollars. Um, I, I have concerns, uh, 1005 specifically, um, originally, LSA had the, the cost estimate at $202 million over the biennium. Um, this past week, that was revised down to $66 million over the biennium. Um, I'm just concerned at, at, at where that reduction came. They, um, they cited that they overestimated the number of students that would be eligible, but I'm still concerned at the, at the potential uh, cost to uh, 1005 with the expansion of the income eligibility. Uh, 412, uh, the, uh, the estimate over the biennium is $112 million, 60 million the first year, 52 million the second year. Um, and then 413, I, I, I do know that sections one through four on that bill were stripped. Um, sections one through four addressed the ability for a county fiscal body county fiscal body to take a portion of our operations fund levy and distribute it to charter schools. Um, I will tell you that most urban schools have circuit breaker caps and um, we already do not receive 100% of our levy. The original language in that bill was very troublesome that they would take a portion of our certified levy, which we don't get all of it, and distribute it to charter schools. That has been stripped and, and is going to a study committee. But the, the rest of 413 talks about the education credits and 
um, at a time when we really need to be focused on appropriating um, all dollars that are available to K-12, we are diverting some of those and um, taking some of that money away from um, dollars that we think are um, important for addressing, especially as we've identified this last year with COVID. Um, if, if there is a need to address some of those, that funding needs to come from a separate source and not from um, sources that would be taken away from the, the K-12 appropriation. Um, I thank you for always listening. I thank you for always being uh, and challenging us um, and pushing us. Um, we just ask for your support to push as many dollars as you can to K-12 education this year. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Oh, one, just one, one. I, I, I do want to also thank you um, for House Bill 1186 uh, was addressing early graduation. And I will tell you, we have, on an annual basis have many early grads and that bill is being um, put into 1001. And I know that there is tremendous support for that. Um, last year we had 61 December grads. This year we had 32. Um, the ability to keep those in our funding for the whole year is extremely important. So I wanted to also thank you for um, pushing that through and adding it to 1001 and, and that being that a part of the school funding formula. Thanks, Dave. Um, these legislative considerations it really have already been mentioned um, this evening, so I won't um, go over those again. But we would appreciate your continued support in these in these areas as we try to navigate this this pandemic. At this time, and I know we're coming towards the end. Um, I'm going to ask Brian Simpkins if there are any questions from our community. Um, Brian, uh, do you have any of those right now? Yes. Uh, uh, for those attending, Can you go back to that you... previous screen. Oh, that last screen. Thank you. And now you can go ahead and talk, Brian. I just, I'm just taking note. Okay, no problem. Yes, uh, for those attending, if you have a question for our um, forum, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll try our best to get to as many as we can. Please be as succinct as possible. That's all I ask. And uh, I do have one to get things started. It's, uh, it's from um, Jenny Whitaker, our president of our Warren Education Association. She says, Warren Education Association encourages you to oppose House Bill 1005, Senate Bill 412, and Senate Bill 413. Indiana already has the nation's largest voucher program. Expanding it now would consume nearly all of K-12 public education's new money for public education and Governor Holcomb's proposed budget. Over 90% of Indiana families choose public education, a notion all of you promote. If any of you are in favor of these bills, would you please explain to Warren's families why you prefer to expand a voucher program that serves less than 10% of all Indiana student population instead of keeping a promise made to public education last year and investing in Warren students? Well, I, I, I would not be in support of expanding the voucher program. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm glad that we're finally taking an accountability so we can see precisely how much money is being diverted uh, to vouchers. And that, that was a long time in coming. Um, I think I saw uh, something about 173 million or something. So um, that's a lot of money taken away from uh, general public education. So I would not be in, in support of that. I echo Senator Bro's statements. I vehemently oppose uh, House Bill 1005 and uh, hope to see it defeated. Uh, this is Aaron Freeman, and I'll just say um, I was looking at the bills as you all were talking. Obviously, I don't serve in the House, and I, I'll let Mitch talk about the status of that bill. It looks like it um, passed out of their uh, education committee, but it's in uh, ways and means. So uh, it's got a hurdle to get through there. But the other one, the other two on the Senate side haven't even been heard. So, you know, I, I would tell you just to take a wait and see approach. I mean, it, it's... Uh, it's getting late in the hour here in turn. I mean, there's, an, there's about 10 days left in this part of the session. So if it hasn't moved, I mean, I'm not telling you it won't, but uh, I mean, I, they haven't moved yet. So. May I just, yeah. May, may I just go ahead? I, I don't have a question. I just want to, I'm just stunned by, by the report that you have given us in terms of just, 
um, all of the challenges you all have had to navigate as part of this COVID. My, my, I guess I do have a question. Have you gotten any kind of guidance uh, aside from CDC as the state giving you any assistance on how to, how to manage any of these very complex issues um, that, that you're going through? Or are you just doing this on your own as, as a school district uh, without any state assistance? Senator Bro, I'll, I'll provide a, a one response to that. Dr. Kane uh, with the Marion County Health Department has been phenomenal. Uh, we have a weekly call with her and the other Marion County superintendents every Friday uh, to review um, new information from the Indiana State Department of Health, new information from the CDC. Um, so that's been very helpful. We participate in the Wednesday governor um, press conferences or, or uh, webinars. Um, we have one of our lead nurses who's um, in connection with ISDH. So we're certainly not doing this by ourselves. Um, we do have guidance from um, those health departments. Um, that being said, as you know, um, it's been an ever changing um, environment. Um, you know, when the cases go up, things change. When the cases go down, things change. And um, it just takes time to respond to that. Well, I, I did want to, I did have a question about, and I have question marks. Um, uh, I believe it was uh, Miss Griffin who talked about the need for, in order to meet the state assessments, um, needing to give the test after school or on Saturdays. What, what is that? Why is that? Um, why is there a need for that? And how, how, how do you propose getting that done it is in order to meet the state assessments these things are yeah i'm I, i'm confused sure sure so um for example uh we'll just take you know sixth through eighth grade i learn um some of our students will be taking math science and social studies or math science and um or in language arts right and each of those components have three to four sections and they are multiple hours of testing. And so um, if I am a sixth grader who attends every other day because I'm hybrid on the other days, that means if it takes me in a normal school year, four to five days to complete ISTEP, I want you now to think about a two week session when a hybrid student only gets to see their teacher five times in 10 days, that means two weeks of direct instruction time that they could be spending with their teachers, learning, reading, Spanish, participating in PE, that will go away because we have to give that assessment. And um, I know, you know, 3,000, 3,200 is a large number, but we are still servicing in all of our schools thousands of students. That's why we're on the hybrid schedule. And so on top of testing our hybrid students that attend every other day, we then have to bring in our virtual students. Some we're going to be able to support during the school day. Their parents um, will feel comfortable enough with all of the precautions that we've put in place to um, ensure that their students can test safely. But some of our families will opt for an after school time. And because we wanna make sure that our students have access to their state testing. Um, We're going to make sure that they have safe times after school or in some cases on Saturday to make sure that they can do that. And so this isn't like our 1200 kids are reporting to middle school every day and we're able to create a sixth grade schedule and a seventh grade schedule and an eighth grade schedule and give that test all at the same time. Um, we can't because we don't see our kids every day and um, because of social distancing, we've had to spread them out all over the building. And on top of that, we've got to create additional groups to meet additional learning needs because of um, language or special needs. Um, it's already a, um, a Rubik's cube when you're trying to plan it for normal school, but it is, yeah, um, it. yeah it's just a lot. But well, one last question, and then I'll let my colleagues ask questions and I will get out of here. Um, is there any kind of provision to have the uh, test scores um, not not be applicable during this period? Is 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 there any way that is there any way that we can either 
um, reduce the uh, stress by making sure that the folks know that this is not going to be a test that's held against them? Or is there some way that we can even postpone these tests during this during this period? Is that something we would have to do in the legislature? Yes. Um, I, yes, I, yes, I believe so. Um, I, uh, is there any provision um, now available to you that would either allow you to, to uh, uh, mitigate the, the scores or not even give the test? Is there any provision in place now for that? Um, to mitigate the score, yes, but not, not to give the test because it's attached to state or to federal funding. Okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, you guys have done um, an, an outstanding job. It's been very impressive. I, 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 feel, uh, I feel for you and that you've had to do that, but I'm also very grateful that you've taken this so seriously and that you've made all these accommodations and, and that you've adapted. And um, it's been, it's, uh, thank you. Thank you for this, for this update. Thank you, Senator. Thank you and safe travels. Thank you. Ryan, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and lead into other um, comments from, from our legislators or questions. Um, Lakeisha, Great. if you would like to ask any questions or comments. I apologize, I was on mute. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to invite me once again. I think this is maybe my fifth year doing this legislative session with you all. So awesome opportunity. My hat's off to you all. Um, you all have gone from educators to food providers, to comforters, to um, filling in the gaps, to co-parenting, to protectors, to you name it. Um, you've been there. First responders, as far as, far as I, I'm concerned, as far as these, these you youth and kids, students are concerned, um, you, you've been their first responders in, in that aspect, not taken away from our first responders, but in their crisis. So thank you so much. Um, listening to your need, your priorities, um, I just wanna say from a council level, what, what I could do is probably um, encourage, we could write a letter, encourage, uh, have our city county council and our uh, leadership encourage the um, state to either go against or for some of the things that you all need. And then specifically, um, I think you guys need that, need to be able to be first on the list for the shot, for the vaccination. Um, I was talking to um, some other workers and this is, this is conversations continuing to come up. Um, maybe I have some thoughts on some things. I won't air it tonight and I'll circle back to Dr. Hansen on um, my thought on that and um, what I could put forth on maybe helping. We could work together on how to get you on the list to maybe prioritization for um, teachers being next for shots. Um, because you know, like Dr. Hansen just said, Numbers change, outcomes change, the story change, things change, they do things differently. I'm not a doctor, I'm not in medicine, um, but I do know everybody I talk to, you know, they put it on the seniors, but the seniors are sick and they're dying because their immune system is weak. Well, everybody I talk to, when I say, hey, are you around kids? And you've been watching yourself and they was like, yeah, I've been around kids and then I got COVID, you know, we know that kids are not as, I'm not putting it on kids, but we know that youth and children are not going to do the preventative measures we would do as adults so that we have to protect the youth and we have to protect our teachers and faculty and staff as well. So whatever I can do, I'm here. Um, put your thoughts and comments for Dr. Hansen. Dr. Hansen, reach out to me and we'll do some follow-up conversation. I have a couple of things in mind I'd like to talk to you about. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you state legisla uh, legislators for the work that you do. Um, it was good seeing you all tonight. Mr. Freeman, good seeing you. Mitch, uh, Dr. Bro, I think, um, Senator Bro, I think she's awful. Good seeing you all tonight. Thank you all for all that you do. I was gonna say, Lakeisha, real quick, I, you don't call, you don't write. I gotta see you once a year. I mean, come on. Thank you, Lakeisha. Uh, Senator Freeman, would you mind um, providing any questions or comments? 
Well, hey, I appreciate the evening, and it's good to see Lakeisha. Um, uh, here's what I'd tell you. Um, God bless you all for, you know, I think everybody's living through, um, you know, a time I didn't know I would be living through. I mean, I just saw my dad and my mom for the first time in person since last March, this past weekend. Um, I mean, we've taken this seriously, and they have, I mean, everybody, I think, is doing it. And, you know, again, bless you all for, you um, you know, what you do and, and all the things you've been asked to do that you probably didn't know you'd ever be asked to do. So um, thanks for sticking in there. Um, and I'll, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, I mean, I, you know, um, Miss Burke's comments at the beginning, you know, look, I was taking notes and I get it, but, um, you know, I hope we can all agree that, um, I mean, I don't hear anybody, you know, um, saying anything other than what's true, which is, you know, God bless teachers and God bless you educators. And, um, you know, the only reason that I'm sitting here as some person in an elected office is because I got a, an education, uh, a public education, by the way, in a small town in Indiana and teachers took some, you know, time with me and thank God I got an education. I mean, I value it. And I um, will tell you, I think all of us, um, you, you know, um, a legislature that's, um, you know, predominantly, um, you know, Republican at the moment. I mean, we value education very much. Um, I don't have to tell you, 763 million more dollars went to education over the last two years. Um, I mean, we spent 150 million to pay down pensions. I mean, we've tried to do everything we can to make sure you all have money. I had them pull numbers. I mean, thank God, you know, from my numbers, I mean, Warren's got over $15 million in CARES Act money, um, in addition to the 86 million uh, that comes to you normally. So, um, and I, you know, there's more money coming and we'll make sure it gets there. But um, look, we all got to work together. We all got to figure this out. Uh, the governor didn't call me and ask me about vaccines. I, I mean, that's a decision that, I, you know, I hope you all can appreciate is not some legislative uh, decision and it's hard and I'm not, don't take what I'm saying is defending the governor. He's got a difficult job and whatever he does, um, somebody's gonna be upset and somebody's gonna be frustrated. But I, I think the governor, and I'm not talking to him about this, but I think when he looks at it, the data shows the death rate from COVID is 65 and above. And the older you are, uh, the more susceptible you are to this. And he has taken the priority of getting, you know, he started at 80 and above and has worked their way down. And I think we're at 65 and over now. So look, we're going to hit teachers um, and we're going to get to teachers. Um, I mean, the governor made the decision to do it by who's most susceptible to this in terms of having a very bad outcome. Um, I'm not saying he's right or wrong, but I'm telling you that I hope you can appreciate uh, that he's doing the best he can with the information we have and, you know, all of us are supporting you and, and want to help you. And um, please don't think there's some, you know, war on teachers or the messaging. You know, I hope you're out there telling people that we're all in this together and we all got to get through it. So uh, that's my message. Thanks uh, for the night. And, um, you know, you know how to get a hold of me if you need me through the year. We appreciate your support, Senator Freeman. Um, Representative Gore, uh, questions or comments? I just, I'll echo uh, some of the sentiments from Councillor Jackson and Senator Freeman. I was already um, in awe of uh, what our public school uh, teachers and staff did uh, before COVID. And now I'm even more resolute in my belief that uh, it's time to uh, reverse the trend of dollars flowing out of public schools. Uh, it's time to uh, listen to the governor's latest report that shows a, uh, a real need for an increase in teacher pay to be able to attract and retain uh, teachers. We have to pay them like the professionals that they are. We know that uh, when adjusted for inflation, uh, public education funding is, uh, has barely kept up with where it was a decade ago. Um, and uh, you know, I just, uh, I learned more and more on the new kid uh, on the block. Uh, freshman legislator. Um, and uh, so uh, I don't have any specific questions now. Uh, this was incredibly enlightening for me. Um, and I'm sure I'll have just gobs of questions uh, over the next uh, probably several years. I, I hope uh, I'll always be uh, learning more and more about this. So 
I know I can reach out uh, to you, Dr. Hanson, and your team. Um, I, I really just want to say thank you to our teachers and your staff there in Warren Township. I'm a proud product of uh, public schools. I graduated from Franklin Central, uh, but my uh, siblings uh, graduated from Warren, and uh, my wife, Brittany, and I live here in Warren. And uh, if we're blessed with uh, kids here in the near future, we look forward to uh, sending them to uh, be with you guys. So uh, I also want to just quickly, I know Rod Elsesser, Mr. Elsesser is uh, watching in right now. I want to give him a shout, uh, himself a former educator. So uh, thank you guys. I really do appreciate you. Thank you, Representative Gore. Yeah, uh, Senator Kreider. Yeah, and thanks. Um, it's always good to be with you and Hopefully I'll be able to see you Friday with the breakfast with the superintendents. I don't know if you'll be able to make it. Um, you know, I've been engaged with the um, superintendents from my district since this began and been incredibly impressed with the work that you folks have done. I got kind of a small taste of the challenges you face as uh, co-chair of the Legislative Continuity Committee as we tried to develop the protocols and rules for how legislature was going to conduct itself this session. And, and so I realized that every time you think you have a solution, something else seems to unravel and, and you folks have stepped up in a huge way. And so um, I was talking to a group of uh, teachers earlier this evening and, and just thank them for um, what seems to be an incredible effort. I've watched my grandchildren interact with their teachers um, as they uh, take their classes online and, um, you know, it's, it's just, you can, you can hear the frustration at times and see it. And, um, so I really appreciate the work that's been done. And so, um, I think, you know, hopefully we're, we're starting to turn a corner on this thing. Uh, but you know, if, if anything, um, this has demonstrated how really um, incredible the education system, the public education system in Indiana is. And so I hope um, that we'll, we'll be able to do good things in the budget. I'm probably one of the few legislators on the, the line tonight that sits on a appropriations committee. And, and so we're, we're already starting our, our conversations and, um, I'm really hoping that we can um, come up with the, the dollars to do good things for public education this session. It's great to be with you as always, and, and I wish everybody uh, good health. and Hope you stay well. Thank you, Senator Kreider. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Rachel Burke um, for uh, board comments. So um, again, I wanna thank everyone for your time tonight. And I'm going to start with Howard Dorsey. Yeah, I, I just want to say thanks for to the legislators for uh, taking out of their busy schedule to come and talk to us and and hear what uh, what we've got to got to present to them uh, to show that the uh, um, uh, how, how tough it really is uh, in in during these times of uh, COVID and all. And uh, I also want to uh, say I, I really appreciate you providing your support for the uh, for the voucher situation. Uh, we really would like to like to to get you to, 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 to hang in there with us on that because that's going to be, uh, that's, that's, that's a problem right now. And also a little relief on the assessments that, uh, that are being uh, thrown at us. Uh, this is a, these are tough times to try and get, you know, assessments uh, done. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear your, 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 your support in that area as well. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much, Howard. Julie French. Hello. Um, I'm not going to repeat what all of our administrators have told you because I know we're uh, running behind. Um, but I do want to uh, reiterate um, what our, our administrators have said about our teachers. They have done an amazing job. Um, I know that I live with a teacher. Uh, my husband teaches out at Franklin Central where it sounds like a couple of you have ties. Um, but I would be very remiss if I did not uh, thank a group of people that has been throwing out thank yous to everybody else, but um, our administrators have done an amazing job uh, working through this, um, these times and, 
and trying to figure out all the rights and wrongs and including, they don't do it top down. They include um, our staff in there too, to because our teachers know what goes on in the classroom. So they're asking our uh, WEA and our and teachers what's going on and, and stuff. So um, I just may wanna make sure we say thank you to our administrators as well. And thank you all for joining us this evening as well. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, Lashana Triplett. Hello, everyone. I apologize if I fade out. I'm having some technical difficulties, but I first want to thank the legislators for uh, being on and um, State Representative uh, Ms. Jackson and taking the time out to um, hear the concerns, not only in the Warren community, but in our community. And to the um, administrators at Warren from a community lens, I appreciate you touching the topics and the elephants in the room that no one wants to tackle because these are real concerns in our community. Um, so as we fight to get more funding into our schools to be able to serve our um, students as well as our teachers and our families, I just appreciate the um, extra efforts that Warren has taken um, to make sure that that happens, which doing uh, racial equality um, surveys, just the extra steps that you guys have taken. And I just would, um, again, as my um, other board members have said to the legislators, whatever you can do to help us make sure that funding stays in our schools and that our teachers are taken care of and prioritized as educators on that list, we would greatly appreciate it. And whatever we need to do, please let us know because we're there. Um, great job, Warren administrators. Thank you so much, Lashana. Gloria Williams. Well, I would like to say thank you to everyone that took time out of their busy schedule to come tonight. And thank you to all of our guests and legislators that came out to listen to our concern. Um, I would just like to say, like David Holt said, thank you for all of your support that you have always given us and some of the things that you've accomplished on supporting us as public school. And we just appreciate you taking time to listen to our concerns uh, and all the things that you've helped us do up until this point. Um, I would appreciate if you would continue to take a look at public education and the vouchers that we were talking about. You know, many of you have said that you graduated from a public school and we wanna make sure that the public school systems are getting what they need and not losing out to charter schools. So it's very, very important that you focus on these bills for us so that the public school system can continue to get the support that they need. And so we appreciate, we, we uh, have faith in you that uh, you will continue to help us. And moving forward, we just look forward to more accomplishments in that area in support of our public education. And as far as our teachers are concerned, whatever you can do to support our teachers, you know, we're looking into the future and, um, you know, like one, uh, I think Freeman was the one that said, you know, he thanked the teachers for giving him such a good education. And if we don't support our teachers and our teachers, and we don't encourage people to go into the teaching profession because they're looking at uh, teachers not getting what they need, then what is that gonna say for our future? You know, we won't have the support we need to educate our students. And so therefore it's so important that we give the teachers the support that they need, uh, more compensation that they need, money that they need, so that they continue to provide the education to our future leaders, which are our students today. So we just thank you for being here. And, you know, like someone said, working together works. So we just thank you for your support. Thank you so much, Gloria. Michelle Wright. I would just like to say thank you very much for coming out and uh, all of your support. We really appreciate it. And again, uh, piggyback off of everybody else. It's very, very important that 
our, the teachers get the vaccine and that they uh, are, and they feel safe so that they come to work and they're productive for these children because that the, they are our future. And without the teachers, we don't have a future. The kids don't have a future. So uh, thank you very much for all your support again and um, stay safe. <laughs> have a blessed evening. Oh, oh, shoot. Oh, no. <laughs> what happened? OK. Um, and so I will end. And um, I am going to do a quick little round robin of some different bills that are out there. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about teacher pay, which is good and something we need to hear and something we need to discuss. Um, I would really appreciate if um, those on the call would really take a look at House Bill 1594, specifically the amendments that were put in today. And it's not that I'm speaking against the amendments, but many of the much of the language that went into the bill today specifically referenced um, the study that came out on teacher pay. But what's interesting is it didn't fix the language that went in today in no way touched on the recommendations made to state government about teacher pay. It put into 1594, what was put in were the references made to school governments about teacher pay, um, policies we could set ourselves and um, in virtually all cases, policies that we already do. And so I find it very interesting and kind of sad that when the state, when the state legislators had the ability to put into that bill language referencing the recommendations made by that um, report as to things the state could do. Instead, they put in, instead, what was the language that was put in was all of the language as to what local leaders could do. And again, those are all things that we are currently doing and or in no way would affect us. Um, I, I wanna reiterate something that um, Representative Gore said earlier. Once you take in to consideration complexity, we are making less than inflation. And we have for the past checks by file since at least um, 2015. During that time, healthcare prices have increased drastically and we are making net less than inflation. Um, that's gotta stop. We, we, we can't keep living on less and less money and doing all of the work that we have to do. Um, I sat in and I know that everyone who's a panelist knows about and respects Larry DeBoer. I don't think there's anyone in the state of Indiana that doesn't respect his work. Um, the comment that he made today on the local government webinar was that virtual education is no less and is perhaps more expensive, if not significantly more expensive than standard, what you do in the classroom, 365 day education. And that's something that needs to be remembered. Um, to co cover a couple other bills very quickly, House Bill 1397, is a CTE bill in which much of the language is really, really good, but there is a section of the bill that strips back money from less than moderate value programs. Um, these are programs that keep our young people and very specifically young women interested in school and keep them in school. They include things like cosmetology, fashion and textile arts, culinary arts, Whole, um, and interestingly enough, horticultural arts, which for a farming state seems to be a really odd thing to decide to quit funding. Um, these may not be the most high paying careers out there, but they are worthwhile and worthy careers. And they are careers that people need to hold. They are careers that our young ladies um, are very, very interested in. And so I really worry about that part of the bill and the funding that it strips from those programs and can potentially affect our young ladies. Um, they need to have a reason to come to school as well. We, we always hear talk about sports and um, media and orchestra and all of those are wonderful and I love them all, but cosmetology for a lot of people, fashion design for a lot of people, that's their reason for going to school. That's the class that they love. That's the thing that affects their heart. And just because it is not the most high paying job out there does not mean that it is not worthy of training and that these young ladies um, are not worthy of being, having their time and efforts 
and that we should not teach that. Not that we would stop teaching it because of course we wouldn't, but that funding shouldn't be going anywhere. This um, is bill number, Rachel, I'm sorry. It is House Bill 1397. And it, it's all pretty decent until you get to that stripping of the, and it's not even a lot of money. It's $200 per student for per program in most cases, but it still is money and yeah. stripping any money, particularly in programs that have a worthwhile purpose, I just am opposed to. Um, another little bill, um, Senate Bill 288 removes, local, um, removes legal protections um, for school libraries. Um, and that's actually removes criminal legal protection for school libraries, um, which is gonna set us up with 90 different um, DAs determining what is and is not appropriate to have in school libraries over 90 different counties. Um, I, I, I think you are opening a, um, just, just opening a problem that doesn't need to be opened and to trust that school libraries have in them what is appropriate for school children. Um, you know, last year there was a lot made about House Bill 1003 passing, um, how it, you, you have the ability to get rid of some regulations and things like that. And yet, I, you put that next to House Bill 1594, which puts a whole bunch of regulations right back in. And again, things that were already recommended that we are doing. And, and it doesn't seem like there's any gain being made. Um, and so I, I, I think there needs to have, you know, these unfunded mandates that are constantly going on. I did the math on Senate Bill 54. So if you assume 900 freshmen, which I understand is a lot, I mean, 900 seniors, but we have a lot of people in our high school and you assume that it takes a counselor or a principal a mere 10 minutes to go through each and every student, that's four work weeks of work being put in for one part of one Senate bill um, for the FAFSA. That, that's four work weeks of work. That is not an insignificant period of time where we have to have someone do that work. And it has to be very specific people. I mean, more people were added. It's not just principal, it can be a counselor. But plus all of that is taking place during a point in time when, when, when we have kids doing FASFAs, that's taking place during a point in time where scheduling is taking place, where talking about the future and next year and graduation, all of those things take place at roughly the same time. It's not like it's taking place during a season of the year when we may, I don't think our counselors ever have spare time, but if we thought that they might, they would have it then, they don't. Um, and so I think, and I would ask that those mandates, especially mandates that carry that big of a price tag in human hours really be looked at. Um, 1005 went from being terrible to less terrible, but in its current form, it does two things. Number one, it increases the amount of money that is paid for vouchers across all levels to 90% instead of capping it at 50% for certain incomes. And number two, it raises the income level to for a family of five over $170,000 um, to qualify. That is, in my mind, by any measure of the imagination wealthy, um, if you're making that much a year. And I am certain for those who live within Warren Township, that is that is definitely spending Indiana tax dollars to support parents and students who have the money to support themselves. You are taking money out of the pockets from our children and giving it into the pockets of those who are making $170,000 a year. Um, there has to be balance. That money has to go towards public education. Um, we appreciate any penny we get because we, we need all of the pennies we can get, but we would ask um, that there is an understanding that we educate everyone. And because of that, often, you know, the complexity index exists for a reason. Those that we educate can be very expensive to educate. Um, that help the complexity index helps even the playing field for all students, not to the point where it really does, but it helps create a chunk in it. Um, if you look at something like the educational savings accounts, and I know they've been renamed a couple of times, and it depends on whether you're looking at the House or the Senate language. If that money goes out and those students return to us after three months, we're still going to end up spending the money 
that we would have spent on them for that nine months that they're in our care. Um, just because we're not getting paid for it doesn't mean we quit providing services. Um, that is stealing from public schools. That is taking money that is spent for children that we can spend on children out of our pockets and making us spend the money anyway. Um, you know, it's not a cost saving measure. It, it, it is it is something that will hurt public schools and will make us move things from one line item to another to make sure that we are providing all students with all education. So that being said, because I had a list, um, we, I, we really do appreciate your time. Um, I have been downtown and I have testified many times over many years. And sometimes you feel as if you're not being heard and sometimes you feel as if you're being heard quite a bit. And what I know is that during this legislative breakfast, which I'm going to continue to call it, um, we know we're heard. Um, we may not always disagree with what we are each saying, but we know you're hearing us and we know that you're taking our concerns very seriously. And we do truly, truly appreciate that as a district and as a board, this opportunity for us to have this dialogue with you and to get in front of you and really make sure that you are able to hear us and we are able to hear you. Um, and so I do want to, again, thank you for your time, especially on this absolutely cold and snowy night um, when I know that you would all probably rather be someplace else, probably someplace warmer unless um, the room that you're in in your house is nice and toasty. Um, but I really, really do appreciate all of your times and all of your comments and to be able to see things that we disagree on from your point of view and to know where we have agreement. Um, we all want the same thing. We want the children of Warren Township to receive the absolute best education they can. Um, we may disagree on how that happens or where that happens, but I know that we all want that. And we all want the teachers of Warren Township to make a livable wage and a fair wage, and we want them to be safe and secure. Um, and so I want to thank you for wanting that along with us because that is really what is important here is our students and our teachers and keeping them safe, keeping them healthy, keeping them fed and keeping them educated. So um, I will, I am capable of rambling forever. And so before I do that, I'm again going to say thank you for your time and your consideration. And um, we look forward to doing this again in a year. Please expect to hear from us, um, especially after that transition period that Senator Fre Freeman mentioned earlier. Um, once bills flip houses, we know what's sticking to the fan and what's not. And so you'll be hearing from us then. And thank you just for always being willing to keep communication lines open. And I hope you have a lovely evening.